How's it going everyone, this is MindBlank, welcome back to my channel and I know I've received a lot of questions as to why I haven't switched to a Ryzen 7 on my workstation already. Well, I finally did it and here's the build, some thoughts and some benchmarks. It's been 5 months since Ryzen 7 has been released and 5 months of me still using my 7700K as the main rig. I do all my videos on this thing and I sometimes game, but the vast majority of time this machine spends it on creating and encoding the videos for the channel. I switched to the 7700K in January and this was actually just a couple of days after moving my then i7-4790K into this year Fantex N2 Pro M case. I didn't gain a lot of performance from the Haswell chip, but deleting the 7700K did allow me to use 5.1GHz as daily for all my needs. I actually only dropped to 5 GHz a couple of weeks ago since it got very hot inside and I hate having fans revved up frequently. But today is a little different since I'm not only giving this PC a new case, I'm also switching to 16 thread awesomeness. So the reasons why I haven't made this switch until today are quite simple. First and foremost it was lack of time. Reinstalling windows and all the programs I need takes quite some time. The second reason, which still applies somewhat, was me waiting for AM4 to become a little more mature. And the last reason is that the 7700K and its high clock speed and IPC did help out in some instances. We'll check out some benchmarks a little later, relevant to content creators. I won't have any game benchmarks here, I'm focusing on what matters to me the most on this particular rig, and besides I only play Overwatch and some BF1 nowadays. I do have quite a few videos nicely detailing the 1700X versus the 7700K in gaming and I will treat games in a separate video that's going to be up in a few weeks. So the case you've been seeing up until now is the Bitfinex Shogun. It's around $160 and is partially made of aluminum with a semi-modular design. This is an extended ATX size chassis so it's rather large and comes with dual tempered side panels. As far as aesthetics go, this might not be everyone's cup of tea, especially considering the slanted side panels and large top and bottom aluminum arches. Although still partially a disappointment, the lack of a PSU shroud isn't that evident considering this removable SSD front wall. Depending on how high the case is kept, cables from the PSU might be evident or completely obscured. On the flip side, the large bottom and top arches do allow for decent airflow. Not the best, but better than what I've seen on other Bitfinex cases. These arches definitely make the case bigger than it could have been and it's again one of those things that you either hate or love. It also comes with three 120mm fans, a modular EATX motherboard extension plate, which I've removed here since I don't need, support for 360mm radiators at the top and a total of 5 SSD caddies. Two front mounted, one behind the removable wall and two at the back. I am for sure a sucker for real glass and this ticks the box quite nicely. The back panel is coated with opaque black paint on the inside, so I'm not worried that my unprofessional wire management will be visible. I'd have loved to see the front also made out of aluminum, but the plastic is pretty thick and textured so that I, at least, don't have to worry about fingerprints. All in all, building in it was a pleasant experience with lots of room, lots of grommeted cutouts and routing options and a ton of space at the back for wire management. You can also replace the 120mm fans with 140s since this case supports them alongside huge 16 inches graphics cards. Anyway, I've decided to power the awesome Asus Crosshair 6 Hero motherboard and Ryzen 7 1700X with another Bitfinex product, the Whisper MPSU. This is a 650 watt power supply and as far as I know it's based on a channel well technology design and is fully modular with 80 plus gold certification. It's a multi-rail design for 12 volt rails and while I don't have the necessary hardware to test a PSU, this is really a solid design and implementation. I really like the sleek black cables on this unit with the exception of the ATX24 pin which has 4 separate ribbons and 2 modular connectors that require you to split them apart. It's rather hard to get this thing in but this is just a minor nitpick to be honest. Most of you already know my 1700X that can do 3600MHz dual channel memory and clocks to 3.97GHz at under 1.4V. I'm also still using the Gigabyte GTX 1070 but I'm really eager to get an RX Vega on this thing and pair it with my FreeSync ultrawide monitor. 
Compared to the ridiculous 6 SSDs I had in my 7700K rig, I'm cutting the number down to only 3, all Kingston drives. A 120GB for Windows, a 512GB KC400 for fast storage and a tiny 60GB drive reserved for Premiere Pro and After Effects cache. And of course, mass storage comprised of 3TB across two Seagate mechanical hard drives. For RAM, I'm using Team Group's Extreme Memory, 16GB of 3600MHz CL18 Samsung B-Die ICs. Absolutely love the way this memory looks and is built, it's like a solid billet of aluminum in your hands. Performance is pretty much what you'd expect from B-Dies and I'm keeping it at 3466MHz CL16 at the moment. Now that I have my 1700X system up and running, expect a review on this RAM soon enough where we'll get a little bit more info on how exactly it pairs with Ryzen IMCs. I'm using Deepcool's RGB Captain to cool the 1700X, which is one of the best price to performance AIOs on the market in my opinion. It's also fairly quiet under load and this is coming from a Noctua D15. You can check out more details in the review of this cooler, but it's time to have some insight on performance. So I went ahead and tested exactly what interests me and other creators. Testing is done with the 7700K at 5GHz and 1700X at 3.97GHz, both paired with 3466 CL16 RAM and a GTX 1070 running factory overclocks. I started off with encoding my Sapphire Pulse ITX RX 570 review, it's not my most complex project by far, but it did take 9 minutes and 37 seconds on the 7700K while the 1700X managed it in 10 minutes and 20 seconds. Premiere Pro is heavily leveraging the GPU for encoding, so results are largely limited by the 1070 here. The 7700K sits around high 80s usage while the 1700X is only hitting 54%. Next up is Warp Stabilizer effect on a 42 seconds nested sequence and we get a glimpse of what the problem is with a 16 core CPU in these programs and these codecs. They are sadly very far away from utilizing the full processing power of the CPU. I've only got 27% usage on the 1700X with the 7700K being at 87%. The situation does change a tad bit when rendering with Cinema 4D's CineRender AE, which relies heavily on the CPU. I use After Effects for different 3D animations and I had high hopes this CPU would shave a lot of time off these huge renders. While it is 7 minutes faster, I am again seeing only 56% usage on the CPU while the 7700K is hammered at 99% average. Such a bummer the software is a letdown. I've also thrown in the Cinebench R15 benchmark since more points here should yield better rendering performance. It does however translate in much better timeline scrubbing on animations and although still a far cry from real time, this is the biggest difference compared to the 7700K. I frequently re-encode 4K to 1080p and I used to do it with Handbrake for its high speed. Over here the 1700X is again taking the lead quite nicely, so I'm going to shave off some precious time, although again the 1700X is quite underutilized. Finally, I also went ahead and did the same on Wondershare's Video Converter Ultimate. You might have already saw this program since I'm featuring it in my videos, but it's really quick. Around 25-40% to faster than Handbrake at the same settings depending on format, video length, etc. And here again the 1700X gives me a nice result with only 65 seconds and a massive 61 frames per second. Alright, so all in all this is a step forward but a let down to see these massive 16 threads not being put to use properly because of software. During encoding the fans on the AIO don't even rev up, keeping the overclocked Ryzen 7 at a cool 53 Celsius and a 29C ambient. Just so you get an idea of how much power there's still in reserve. As for gaming, well I'm sure the 1700X and 3466 CL16 RAM will not let me down regardless of the GPU in the system. I think that a Ryzen 5 1600 is still the best bang for the buck for anyone still using Adobe's content creation software. I don't know how things stack up with other programs and if they fully leverage the power of a 16 core, but I'm not ready to switch just yet on Premiere Pro and After Effects. Alright everyone, this wraps it up and don't forget to leave your comments, questions and suggestions. While you're at it, check out my Twitter and Patreon pages linked in the description down below and thank you for supporting this channel by subscribing, see you next time everybody, bye bye.